Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming on a very stormy and windy evening. Uh, I would just like to begin by reminding ourselves that we are located on unceded indigenous land. Uh, Jojake Munyang, Montreal is historically known as a place of gathering for many First Nations and uh, it is today home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples and we respect the continued and connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples in, within the Montreal community. We also continue to work so these words find their way practically on a daily basis. Um, so this, uh, this lecture by Mark Sussman is part of the public programs uh, that are happening parallel to the exhibition uh, Stage for Rebellion, uh, curated by Julia Eiler-Smith. Um, Um, in response to, to the exhibition, uh, A Stage for Rebellion, this talk revisits the landmark exhibit Show People, Downtown Directors and the Play of Time that happened at the Exit Art in 2002 in New York. And it presented the work of six radical artists from the alternative theater and performance scene in New York. During the 60s and the 70s, artists have occupied and a host of urban sites, lofts, churches, street art galleries, wherein they, they developed bodies of work informed by experiments across their artistic disciplines. Um, how might a review of this exhibition of show people, uh, how might a review of, of, of that exhibition in the wake of a rich subsequent history of presenting performance histories via print and video documents, props, artifacts, immersive spaces, and live reconstructions, how might it allow us to interrogate the evolution of strategies and conventions for presenting the liveliness, the liveness, the liveness of radical performance? So Mark Sussman, uh, Mark Sussman is a theater artist and a scholar working on the animation of the public space, material dramaturgies, puppetry, and object performance, and the integration of old and new technologies in live performances. He is the co-founder of the New York-based collective Great Small Works. He is professor of theater and director of the Center of Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Culture at Concordia University. He is also the founder of Café Concret, a Montreal cabaret of experimental puppetry and object-based performance. His writing has appeared in TDR, Connect, Stage Bill, Cabinet, Radical Street Performance, and Puppets, Mask, and Performing Objects. His notes on the new model theaters can be found in the Routledge Companion to Puppetry and Material Performance. And on New York's Circus Amok can be found and the Rutledge Circus Studies reader. Voila. Thank you, Mark, for being with us. Um, I would leave the floor to you. We will uh, open the floor for a Q&A after, after, after the lecture. All right. Is this, is this good? Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Lynn, for the introduction and for organizing this evening. And thank you, Julia, for this uh, quite incredible show and I just want to say it really rewards multiple visits um, it's it's almost well I, for me it was too much to take in in one uh, one visit so I hope uh, in the next week for as long as it's still on you can you can really take advantage of it um, I kind of hope you've already forgotten the first part of Lynn's introduction, because it's sort of, it's going to be repeated in the paper, uh, so uh, you'll hear some of those questions again. I hope that's okay. Um, is sound all right? Sound good? Yes? Okay. Um, so this is called, uh, slightly revised title, From Show People to a Stage for Rebellion, Thoughts on Exhibiting Performance. Um, and I will get my fluids ready. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, in a catalog ex essay for the exhibition Out of Actions Between Performance and the Object, 1949 to 1979, organized by Paul Schimmel at the Geffen in Los Angeles, the curator quotes Kleiss Oldenburg's use of the phrase residual objects. Quote, the performance is the main thing, but when it is over, there are a number of subordinate pieces which may be isolated, souvenirs, residual objects. To pick up after a performance, to be very careful about what is to be discarded and what still survives by itself. Slow study and respect for small things, one's own created found objects. The floor of the stage is like the street. Picking up after is creative. Also, their particular life must be respected." Un end of quote. That's Oldenburg. Learning of plans last fall for this extraordinary show, A Stage for Rebellion, I was led to think back to another exhibit that deployed objects and narrative elements to present the particular life of a group of theater and performing artists, in this case from the avant-garde scene in New York City. In the post-war decades, theater, dance, music, and performance artists had occupied all kinds of urban sites, lofts, churches, streets, warehouses, piers, and galleries, informed by experiments across and between the disciplines and in dialogue with the possibilities offered by the city. They built networks of communal, tribal, and familial relations that persisted beyond the discrete performances of particular works, both on stage and off, transforming how, when, and where theatrical events could be made. They worked well outside of the established Broadway system or the emerging off-Broadway network, which featured script-based plays or musicals. Over time, a new nonprofit system emerged that had become institutionalized by the time show people opened in 2002. So we're looking back at, at this exhibit that took place in 2002. Subtitled Six Downtown Directors and the Play of Time. Oh, there you go. Um, You'll see that in a minute. The show was organized around a series of stage directors and their reflections on how the city had contributed to the formation of their early work. My interest is not in representing the solo genius careers of avant-garde heroes and heroines. Rather, I'd like to reconsider the strategies of display and installation, almost as a time capsule or a collection of snapshots giving form to those interconnected communities of practice, many of them still active today. Archives are, as we know, tools of power, and their careful arrangement in public reminds us of the contingency and playfulness that they summon and afford. How might we, reconsidering Old Oldenburg's hierarchy, the main thing versus the souvenir? By what logic are found objects found? While much critical writing has focused on these directors as individuals, I hope it might be useful to bear in mind, again, the communities, the collectives, which depend on the labor of often anonymous or lesser known performers to embody, enable, and generate the work. Further, I'd like to propose that this is partly where the radicality of these directors sits, in their abilities to coalesce social entities on stage and off that exist beyond individual productions? And how might a revision of show people across a 20-year record of presenting performance via print and video documents, props and artifacts, immersive spaces, and commissioned live reconstructions in museums reveal how those strategies and conventions have shifted? How does A Stage for Rebellion, for example, present, evoke, and extend the liveness of radical, politically engaged theater, whether conceived of the staging of a play text or the theatricality of a single gesture or a speech in the wake of post-colonial struggle and emancipation movements? As far as I know, there's no comprehensive genealogy of how the legacies of radical performance groups have been collected and presented. 
Nevertheless, we have a rich accumulation of examples that engage with debates among performance theorists concerning the inherent ephemerality of live arts, the disappearance of the moment of performance, and its endurance in the realms of affect and memory. So this opens lots of scholarship we could point to, and I'm just going to scratch the surface. Um, right away, I'd like to acknowledge Rebecca Schneider's reminder to be cautious when allowing the binary of then and now of liveness versus, say, the document, photograph, score, or text to creep into our language. The unrepeatable liveness of performance may seem self-evident, and its disappearance may seem to be constitutive of its ontology, as Peggy Phelan famously asserted. But it is a liveness, Schneider argues, that is always already a repetition, in tension with its capture, its preservation, and its legacy. Similarly, props, puppets, objects, documents, and texts may appear at first glance as inert or fixed, Yet we know that the ephemera of archives, material and immaterial alike, have a lively afterlife. Quote, the question of the remains of performance, Schneider writes, and the debate about whether and how performance disappears and or remains, has arguably, arguably been one of the most fecund questions to result from the expansion of the study of performance into its broad spectrum, unquote. This is made all the more complex when we consider the theatrics of political resistance, which is always aimed at bringing a new world into being, pushing at the boundaries of what can be said, calling into being a utopia on the horizon, quote, outside the cultural habituation to the patriarchal, West-identified, arguably white cultural logic of the archive, unquote, as Schneider says later in her essay. Institutional theaters keep records, images, plans, scripts, press clippings, board minutes. Radical experimental groups, particularly those engaged in political struggle, often don't have the same archival impulse or infrastructure, whether by choice or circumstance. Their material archives may be precarious, to say the least. Museums, public libraries, or university special collections often preserve the records of these communities, leading to the question of how archives may be animated, extending the work and continuing their life in the world. The material artifacts of radical theaters may be dispersed or disappeared. The work may require reconstruction or reimagining. There may also be an excess of material, whole museums from which to choose photos, media scripts, artist statements, etc., and especially oral histories. The ripples extend endlessly, even to the memories of company members and audiences in attendance. We can imagine a continuum, then, with the presentation of material objects at one end to embodied reanimations through newly commissioned or reconstructed performances on the other. To recall again Schneider's use of the word remains, this complicates our understanding of the live and the not live, the still and the moving, now and then, as we consider a short but dense history of exhibiting performance of the past decades. For example, and I realize this is a partial, highly subjective, and rather New York-centric list, we might consider the solo shows of Jack Smith and Reza Abdo, both held at PS1, the Judson Dance Theater and Marina Abramovic shows at the New York MoMA, Joan Jonas at the Tate, Rituals of Rented Island on Loft Performance Culture at the Whitney, Radical Presence, Black Performance in Contemporary Art at the Studio Museum Harlem, the Puppet Show at Philadelphia's Institute of Contemporary Art, University of Toronto Professor Seika Boy's archival show currently touring called It's About Time, Dancing Black in Canada, 1900 to 1970 and now. The list will end, I, I promise. Bettelheim and Nunley's landmark Caribbean Festival Arts, each and every bit of difference at the St. Louis Museum in 1988, and the important work of curator Claire Tenkan's 
focusing on the carnival, masquerade traditions, and festival arts of the African diaspora in the Circum-Atlantic, including en masse at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans in 2014. I'll return to this last one later. All very different approaches, and is it even possible or useful to consider these under a single rubric of performance exhibitions? This is a bigger question for another day. Now, finally, to show people. Conceived by Exit Art Gallery director, uh, artistic director, Papo Colo, and curated by freelance dramaturg, festival producer, and longtime Worcester Group performer, Norman Frisch, show people, downtown directors, and the play of time, revisited six careers from the previous three decades in New York City. The curator asked each artist to reflect on their early careers as a way to create a three-dimensional ethnography of the small theater community that came to be known as downtown in the big city. Held in 2002, the show took place at the alternative nonprofit Exit Art, founded 20 years earlier by Jeanette Ing Ingberman. The gallery entrusted the show to someone from a theater and festival background. Frisch drew on his experience as a dramaturg to anthologize a group of directors associated with this downtown milieu, an alternative economy of self-produced creation, often in non-institutional spaces. It also meant an intertwined community of artists coming from the theater, dance, visual arts, experimental music, new opera, and underground cinema, all seeing each other's work in a handful of spaces and collaborating within, outside, and around their disciplines. This mythology has undergone revision by generations of critics who consistently expand the roster of who appears in the record of a remarkable moment of freedom in the city's economic, land use, and artistic history. Show People then offered a series of mini installations in collaboration with each director. A timeline wall at the start of the exhibit invoked the notion of individual biography and decidedly linear temporal progression. Each was assigned a section of the gallery evoking the atmosphere of their work. To see performance artifacts on display now seems quite common, but at this time it felt like a novel kind of theatricality occupying the gallery, an homage to the particular radicalism of each director's approach to invention with space and time. Just past the timeline on the wall, one entered a long, narrow space devoted to the work of Robert Wilson, with industrial charcoal gray carpeting and sharply focused spotlights, the space recalled the formality and precision of Wilkes Wilson's stagings, his painterly use of light and restra restrained use of color. Along one wall were the graphite, graphite storyboard drawings from 1976 for the opera Einstein on the Beach, that's on this side, with music by Phil Glass. And throughout were chairs designed for various productions, recalling Wilson's primary training as a designer and the practice of making sketches, studies, and objects later for sale by commercial galleries to help fund his projects. Wilson famously starts with pencil or charcoal storyboards with text elements often added at the last minute. A subtle soundtrack of dialogue from the opera A Letter for Queen Victoria played in the space, acoustically softened by the carpeting. Missing, though, was reference to the community of birds, the extended family of performers, largely trained by Wilson in early loft experiments, extended dance jams, and epic touring shows, prior to his turn to working mainly with trained singers and dancers for the Einstein Opera. I'll explain birds if you later. Uh, Meredith Monk is a composer of music and a choreographer of communities on stage, a storyteller without linear narrative. She works with and between theater, dance, film, and music, and with gesture, nonverbal song, juxtapositions of objects, landscape, and projected images. 
She describes herself as working, quote, between the cracks, where the voice starts dancing, where the body starts singing, where theater becomes cinema, unquote. Through a slit in a white muslin curtain, one slipped into a room devoted to Monk. In the center were three white singing suitcases. You can sort of barely see them in the center out of which poured the sound of her melancholy volcano songs when you opened them. On one wall, a film loop of fire. On the floor, the neatly laid out sheet, quilt, and pillows of a bed, guiding viewers to politely step around. And the index of these, performers, uh, of these performances was the shoe timeline. I think you can see that in a narrow glass vitrine containing a line of footwear from the highly customized platform shoes to, ev to everyday sneakers, all of them worn by Monk on stage over several decades. And that's a long list of the descriptions of all the shoes. Uh, full of the sweat and effort of rehearsals, performances, touring, they stood as evidence of the particular worlds of Monk's works in which many types of feet dance and many voices sing. Those communities confront dangerous and demonic forces. The Holocaust in Europe, for example, in the work Quarry from 1976. And the shoes, ordinary things made extraordinary, held a second life of those temporary communities and the bodies that danced in them. Next door was a crowded room devoted to the work of artist, director, and bread baker Peter Schumann, co-founder and with his partner Elke Schumann of the Bread and Puppet Theater. Launched in New York in the early years of performance activity at the Judson Memorial Church in Greenwich Village, the company based itself on the Lower East Side, Coney Island, Harlem, and ultimately Northeastern Vermont by the mid-70s. A school bus load of paper mache, cardboard, and fabric puppets, masks, reliefs, and miniature and gigantic figures filled the space to the ceiling, installed as you might find them today in the company's dairy barn turned museum, just a couple hours down the road from here. The room was rigged with clotheslines on which were mounted cardboard cutout clouds. The air was filled with angelic populations and crowds of demonic figures, proclaiming manifestos and political slogans, denouncing American imperialism and capitalist economy. Some silly, some serious, painted on cardboard placards. In the center, a giant wheel with a crank and the instruction turn produced a sound of wind and lightly jiggled the strings, animated the, animating the characters above one's head. Quote, I very much thought of cathedrals, Schumann has said, speaking of his early attraction to puppets in a CBC radio interview. Quote, and this overwhelming life that you have when you step into a cathedral, with all these saints and sculpted creatures that are there, and what a communal space that is. And to lift those off and to move them, I think that was one of my first thoughts when I started making big puppets, to animate the stones in the cathedral, unquote. The abundance of imagery combined with the ordinary nature of the materials used invited the, the visitor to step into the role of puppeteer, fighting political institutions with cardboard and paper mache and making this decidedly secular cathedral come alive with handmade movement and sound designed to give form to a desire for communal life without the ideology or exclusivity of organized religions. A brightly lit space with cast iron columns recalled the narrow loft where Richard Foreman staged many of his plays under the banner of the Ontological Hysteric Theater. Entitled, 10 Things I Hate About Theater, the space was wallpapered with pages from the playwright's notebooks, enveloping the visitor in a paranoid stream of consciousness flow of language and dreamscape. This recalled Foreman's method of writing long blocks of text before assigning bits to actors. Foreman, trained as a playwright, quickly became attracted to the 1960s underground film scene, incorporating cinematic elements of acting and composition into his idiosyncratic loft shows. 
the space enacted a refusal of traditional theater conventions, employing distraction, multiple foci of, intention, of attention, and an excess of symbolic forms, using Foreman's signature all over coverage of the walls and floor with esoteric pictograms, nonsense, and hallucinations reflecting on human psychology and the mechanics of perception. His trademark black and white dotted line strings bisect the space. You can sort of barely see those. Marking an invisible proscenium. And a series of 35 millimeter black and white production stills mounted on the wall were equipped with stereoscopic viewers, offering a sequence of 3D peep shows inside the director's psychic landscape. Finally, I'm not going through all six. This is the last. I'll talk about, finally, oh, the space devoted to Reza Abdo, the only one of the six no longer living, both then and today, stood in high contrast. <clears throat> Born in Tehran in 1963, already a director as a teenager in London, and dead from complications from AIDS by age 32, Abdo was a maverick demanding highly physical and emotional work of his close-knit company. After a move from Los Angeles, the Dar Aluz company staged four legendary shows in New York in the early 90s. The work triggered a shockwave with its raw physicality, fierce critique of American politics, wry Warholian delight in the banality of pop culture, and sheer rage at the indifference of medical institutions, homophobia, racism, and tribal violence. The company's final work, Quotations from a Ruined City, was staged in an industrial loft and took aim at the atrocities of the Bosnian War. Abdo's work became the nucleus for a deeply devoted theater family, made all the more close by his illness and the knowledge that time was short. It was entirely characteristic then that the space devoted to Abdo be almost entirely free of objects or memorabilia, with the exception of two giant masks, one black, one white, both evoking the stereotypes of minstrel shows posed against black walls and directly opposite a company portrait by Annie Leibovitz that you see here. Instead, the space painted black contained risers, a projection wall, and a revolving schedule of video screenings of the company's productions and film works throughout the time that the exhibit was up. According to his wishes, the company, founded only four years previously, was disbanded at the time of his death, leaving a video archive to be circulated and screened really for the first time on this occasion. Here we saw a denial of the experience of immersion, of the illusion of access to the aesthetic world of the auteur, or rather, it was a more austere kind of immersion, with the focus on documentary experience of the work itself and sidestepping of nostalgia that a display of objects might evoke. His work was meant to stand alone without supplement or explanation, and here the company played in the foreground, the director present in his absence. So, recalling show people today gives us a momentary snapshot of the dramaturgical preoccupations and material practices of each artist, evoking the community, the tactility, the realm of sensation of the work. It also raises the erasures, exclusions, and amnesia that make such narratives of, of allegedly solo agency possible. And it raises the question of how we honor the collectivity of collective creation, even, with those co even when those collectives contain hierarchies and authorial visions. How do we reach beyond the evocation of individual works or the visions of individual artists by displaying that other ephemeral object, not the performance itself, but the social life of groups committed to political change and revolutionary activity? This is a great moment to transition to speaking about this great exhibit around us. 
So finally, this remarkable exhibition, A Stage for Rebellion, offers a collection of theatrical gestures, objects, documents, and artifacts from a period of unfinished global decolonization. A different order of time is in play here. There are no timelines on the wall, no documents in vitrines. The strategies of the artists grouped here range from full reconstructions of prior radical theatrical actions to the staging of fragments, memories, and text from performance incarnations in contemporary times, places, and bodies. A stage for rebellion offers an occasion to consider some responses to these questions. Presenting theatrical scenes, political manifestos, and staged dialogues, the show features popular theater forms, parade, procession, masked dance, and aleatory walks. But here we are not, and I'm not being at all exclusive, there's lots more uh, than that. <laughs> Rather, we move here from work to work, across media, in a kind of carnival space and time where the relation of original and document is upended or simply elided. No hierarchy of main thing or souvenir. Sounds and light from the screens bleed through the space. A feature of the carnivalesque is that it not only inverts the laws, conventions, and taboos of everyday life, but carnival scrambles our sense of history and memory, posterity and linear time, immersing the visitor and asking them to orient the themselves to each work. So with reference to the carnivalesque, I want to return briefly to the work of curator Claire Tankons, who I mentioned in that list of performance exhibits. Um, Claire Tankons, whose 2014 show En Masse with co-curator Krista Thompson, asks the question, quote, how might carnival be critically inserted within the history of the exhibitionary complex, end quote. As part of a long-term investigation of Carnival and its presence within art historical and exhibition frameworks, Tankons and Tompkins commissioned nine artists to make work in response to the popular Circum-Caribbean Carnival, Junkanoo, and Mas traditions, still vibrant, while also subject to intense commodification and the tourist gaze. Rather than documenting a single vision of Carnival, past or present, Thompson asks how Carnival has, quote, structured and informed a perceptual apparatus for artistic practice in the Caribbean. To name just one example, the show included objects and video by artist Hugh Locke from a project called Give and Take, made for the Tate Turbine Hall in relation to London's Notting Hill Carnival, a large-scale, popular, and heavily policed gathering in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. Locke's critical insertion of Carnival into the space of the museum deployed a Brazilian samba reggae band accompanied by, quote, a group of masqueraders wearing devil masks reminiscent of those he experienced in Carnival in Guyana and carrying shields, unquote. The shields, reminiscent, which you see here, reminiscent of those used by militarized police in riot gear, were covered with beautiful photographs of expensive Notting Hill buildings. Quote, representations of a surveilling gaze, one that claims and asserts ownership and blocks many other racial and class dynamics from view, unquote. Functioning as wearable sculpture, these puppet buildings formed a portable street when standing end to end, evoking, quote, the fraught histories of accommodation, containment, and exclusion, exclusion that have characterized the relationship between black Britons and some mainstream art institutions, unquote. A commentary on land use in the neighborhood, yes, but also on the real estate of the museum, where its implied expectation of a literal representation of a, quote, anthropologically marked tradition, meaning carnival. And that quote is from Shannon Jackson. The vernacular is positioned 
To borrow from performance scholar Shannon Jackson's essay on the show, quote, not only as an object of study, but as method of study. I'll say that again. Carnival is seen here not only as an object, but as a method of study, unquote. Instead of presenting artifacts and timelines in the gallery, this work brought the tensions around the social fact of Caribbean popular arts in London to the fore, the spirit of festivity carrying a critical message. So Tankons and Thompson and Colo and Frisch then bring spirits of theatricality into the exhibition space in contrasting ways by refusing to repeat the conventions that the institution expects of a popular performance tradition with its long record of continuity and by collaborating with artists to present their vision of their early careers distilled in immersive rooms using material artifacts in an avant-garde hall of mirrors. In a scene from a Rebellion, another curious and evocative procession of vaguely medieval figures punctuate this show, a silent pageant of, quote, character troubadours made from found objects that artist Ashes Withman calls the Neanderthalish proverbs. And you see one watching us there and another right there. There's throughout the, the exhibit and they're Super interesting. Um, we are confronted by a sense that these are accessories, musical instruments, prosthetics, or costumes left in the aftermath of a parade or street action. Are they the characters themselves, their attributes, or both? They are clearly performing objects in suspense, inviting activation. And so, like Monk's shoes or Schumann's wind machine, they bring a potential energy into the space. Their titles and iconography bring to mind the inherent danger to the powers that be brought on by festivity. Emil Patil's line processes across printed pages titled Many Kilometers, Several Words recreating the artist's father's story told as a series of postcard messages sent by an itinerant factory worker to his faraway wife. Patil's father was a dramaturg, actor, and playwright dedicated to the stories of migrant and factory workers. Patil tells his father's story in two media, across the printed pages on the wall and via a series of recorded gestures on screen. We watch at least several performances at once, the repetition of the mechanized gestures of factory workers, the father's repetition of those gestures, and the son's imagination of the father's repetition. A lot of layers. Hugo Carrillo's anti-authoritarian play, staged by students in 1962, El Corazón del Espantapajaros, Espantapajaros, the Heart of the Scarecrow, was staged at the Popular University of Guatemala in 1975, resulting in, traumatic, in a traumatic series of oppressive events, leading to the cancellation and silencing of the production's memory. Thanks to a family connection to the troupe, Naufus Ramirez Figueroa gives the play new life in multiple ways, including a series of aquatints on paper in which animals and humans both living and dead, appear and confront the viewer from cornfields where scarecrows live at night. And in a single channel video made in the identical location from the all but erased 1975 staging entitled Lujar de Consuelo, Place of Solace by Ramirez Figueroa and writer Winston Gonzalez. The video presents a series of walks, climbs, processions, dances, and static presentations of political and metaphysical figures, recalling the stock characters of Commedia dell'arte or other pantomime traditions. 
In one scene, a dancer in a big rubber clown shoes, in big rubber clown shoes, a partially abstracted harlequin mask that allows plenty of space to see the eyes of the performer and covered in shaggy strips of what looks like green vinyl, scales, climbs, crawls, and drags themselves up, ascending the spiral staircase of what appears to be a university atrium with a tense, intense verbal and nonverbal vocalizations. The climb is harrowing. The movement starts, freezes, falls back, and surges forward as the body turns over on itself, a mundane action turned into an emotional and physical marathon, evoking the difficulty that must have attended this work of theatrical reanimation, and perhaps calling the powers that be from 1975 to account. And finally, in the wake, the large video installation by the Living and Dead Ensemble, which would normally be here, processional time is circular, or more precisely, spiralist. The multi-channel -chan sound demands an intense kind of listening as speakers on three screens deliver pol political manifestos, poetic insights, and social critique while walking down urban side streets, at times addressing the camera or using a megaphone to deliver announcements to the neighborhood. Finally arriving at gatherings that resemble street demonstrations, complete with painted signs and a brass band. The three-panel triptych recalls the medieval narrative tableau of gods, demons, and saints, performing objects that stood in between the animate and inanimate realms, achieving the status of personhood with the power to heal the believers when activated. And yet these, these people who uh, uh, are pictured in the video are kind of the opposite of uh, heroic or, or religious icons. They're, they're uh, delivering uh, sober critique, uh, back and forth conversation. Um, um, it's well worth, well worth coming to listen. In the space of theatrical memory and partial incarnation proposed by a scene for rebellion, acts of performance are never entirely past out there awaiting reconstruction, mimesis, or lively documentation. They're in here, collective memories of resistance awaiting us to complete them. Thank you. Maybe there's a little time for discussion. There's, of course, there's lots more to say about the works in, in this gallery. Um, and I really only scratched the surface of a few of them. But um, what I, I was speaking with, with Julia, who, who curated the exhibit earlier uh, before we started. And um, I'm really quite struck with how very different proposals are made here about what what theater is, what it means, and the exhibit as a whole, I, for me anyway, left me with a real puzzle to think about um, this dynamic of of sort of, you know, in theater we think about uh, animating scripts, we think about um, designs that precede performance, we think about. Uh, video as document that somehow comes after. And as I hope I, I tried to, uh, to suggest a little bit, um, that linearity, that timeline, um, that sort of sense of before and after is really beautifully disrupted here. And you really, uh, you know, the performance really is sort of here in the space, not, not you know, there, there are certainly antecedent elements, texts, ideas, there are reconstructed elements, of course, but um, yeah, what I find very striking is, is the, the strong presence of the work. So I don't know if there are any questions or comments or your thoughts and Um, video capture. The the first uh, exhibit you showed is it called Stage People? Show people. Show people. 
I have a feeling that um, this is just my own yeah. personal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, all of those artists, I, for me, had a period like where they're kind of more dynamic and more inventive, and then a later period, maybe more <laughs> classical period, where they repeated themselves a lot. And and um, that show, 2003, seems like a maybe a kind of pivot point between their earlier period and their later period. I wonder if you have any thoughts on on that exhibit being in that point in their trajectory. That's a great question. It's something I thought about quite a bit. Um, and it's a little bit different for each artist, and I, I won't go through them all. And there are some I didn't cover, um, partly because I didn't have images. Uh, Anne Bogart, major director, is also included. and. Uh, um, but for you're right about the the pivot point and the a kind of a moment of of um, a certain repetition. So the show, if it if it has well, it may have many flaws, but one potential flaw we could think about is is a sense of nostalgia. But it was it was um, the assignment to the six directors was to say, how would you portray your early career? and in, in dialogue with the city. How did the city inflect your work? And um, so it was an assignment for them to do a job of kind of looking back and uh, sort of at the before time when things were still emerging and coalescing and starting out. And some did that more than others. But the, the temporality of each, obviously Reza Abdo is, is a, a different case because uh, as being the only one not living at the time, so this, there was this sharp endpoint to the work, and the sh the room was all about, you know, uh, letting that work be seen by the public, because uh, you know it was more legendary than accessible at that point. Um, but it's true that some like Foreman Wilson, in particular, uh, Meredith Monk, I think, you know, is still working, kept working, kept composing. Um, uh, Foreman had a long, another like good 15 year run of making new plays. But you're right, there was a sort of cookie cutter style that had emerged by that point. Uh, certainly Wilson kind of became well, a sort of a commodity of his own work. Um, but I don't want to, you know, some of the subsequent operas and works were fabulous and some were, oh, shrug, yes, he, 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 he showed up the day before and, you know, <laughs> the assistants did all the work. You know, you could sort of tell some of that at certain points. Um, Schumann, uh, you know, at age 89, it just got back from making a, a flock of hundreds of birds for the Palestine demo in Washington that took place on Saturday, uh, you know, and is out there. Like, uh, I mean, maybe the aesthetics are somewhat sort of codified, but the energy is still alive and well with some of these artists. But yeah, others are thinking more about legacy and and archives and placement of, of archives. So it is quite different with each of them. But you're, you're right. Oh, the last thing I'll just say about a pivot, which I sort of alluded to, but the, the year 1976 and Wilson's work, the year of Einstein on the beach, was sort of when he kind of, he kind of left behind all the um, non-trained performers that had gravitated around him and sort of come to work because, you know, it was like therapy or it was a cool thing to do at the time. And he sort of said, okay, now I'm working with trained opera singers um, to sing Philip Glass's music and trained dancers to do um, uh, Andy DeGroat's choreography. And he, he sort of made a very conscious step into, you know, professionalizing. And so some, some critics have said, oh, that's, that represents a break too as well. So it's interesting that, that, that what he chose to show was Einstein, like my, you know, my f more f slick, not slick, but you know what I mean, sort of more finished work. But yeah, it's great to think about. Yeah. Julia Eiler-Smith, curator of this amazing exhibit. Hiding in, here in the back. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. It was really fascinating, fascinating sort of uh, um, history that you, you drew. And I mean, it seems like we, ha right, we had access to some material that is very difficult to find. And so I thank you for sharing that. And we were mentioning uh, when we were talking earlier that I don't know 
I don't know that there is an exhibition history right. of um, uh, exhibition of history of exhibitions that um, show uh, address uh, theater histories. This, this is very specific, but um, I'm curious to know what have been the shows that have uh, um, to know more about what are the shows that have dealt with this history and you. Right. You you provided some, definitely some points of um, access in that history. So thank you for that a lot. Um, and my question was um, regarding audience. The audience for that exhibition, Exit Art. Uh, who do you think the 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 who do you think was the audience that the curators slash playwright had in mind um, when you went to see the show? You took the photographs. Yeah. which I find fascinating. It's, it's, it's quite rare to um, have someone who was there on site. And I mean, you're, create, you're creating an archive for that show that I'm not sure exists um, in depth. But yes, so who uh, was the audience uh, that they had in mind? Who was there when you visited? Um, I mean, and what, what brought you to visit that show? And then yeah. um, perhaps I can add my question after. No, it's gr a great question. Uh, I mean, it's a little hard to remember. Um, but so Norman Frisch, who curated it, is, uh, as I mentioned, is a, a, a dramaturg. He had worked a little bit as a performer, but was really trained in dramaturgy. Uh, and uh, so worked with many of these artists on productions um, as a sort of outside eye and kind of keeper of ideas. And um, he also had done, uh, I think, maybe some teaching at NYU, which was just down the street from where Exit Art moved a number of locations. It's no longer operating. But uh, at the time, it was in a loft on Lower Broadway, so kind of a few blocks down the street from where New York University is based, where Tisch School of the Arts is. And uh, so a lot of students were there when I, the times I visited. Um, of course, you know, at an event like the opening, all the constituencies of all these companies, all the performers who had participated were, were there, um, uh, you know, to sort of see how it had turned out. Um, and then on more quiet days, there would just be people screening videos. There was another little, I didn't really mention this, there was another little area where you could, not Reza Abdo's screening area, but another one, where you could kind of order up different productions of different uh, uh, artists. So there was kind of a video library that you could, uh, you could kind of pick from. Um, but I would, I mean, I, offhand I would say a lot of students. Um, and. Um, and then, you know, folks from the community. Um, I don't, you know, Exit Art had a very interesting run. It was probably closest to uh, what here we would call an artist-run center. Like it was really nonprofit, really grassroots, um, not engaged in sort of high-end commercial shows, but really uh, very, you know, thoughtful, um, uh, politicized shows um, and they did publications and again performance events and all kinds of things um, so uh, beyond that it would be hard to generalize more about you know the demographics it's it's uh, it's a bit hit or miss but but I do I, I can s definitely say there was a kind of a kind of audience of you know younger folks who didn't know the work who were seeing it for the first time there, which was sort of interesting. I think that was their intention, um, was for it to be a kind of an introduction. Um, and just about the slides, I feel like there are, there's, I was saying to Julia earlier, there's this box of slides that's been sitting in my desk for all these years, and I think there's more, but missing, so I have to, <laughs> oh, and I have to thank the, the visual arts, uh, no, visual, VCR, I never remember what it's saying, visual, Collections repository at Fine Arts in the EV building that digitized the slides. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. For <laughs> you that. had another. Yeah, my other part. question was um, basically each of these presentations in that show um, seemed like they're 
using different curatorial strategies, right. but they're, they're the artists them, themselves who were, well, the playwrights themselves, who were um, making those suggestions. I was curious about if, the, if there was an awareness of the range of strategies that, or the, you know, the panorama of strategies that w was presented in the exhibition, perhaps in the text, or if this is really sort of you uh, coming and, and reading into all these different uh, exhibition strategies? I, I think the latter. I don't, real, I don't recall. I mean, I have th what was handed out in terms of the printed materials and, and some critical um, reception of the show uh, in you know, various publications. Um, but I, don't, I didn't see any reflection on that. I don't, and... Uh, there must have been, of course, there was on the part of, again, when I, I'm not sure everyone's familiar with the term dramaturg because it's sort of a theater word, but uh, you know, a dramaturg is someone who who is sort of like the interlocutor or you know, with a director or someone who kind of I always use this word keeper of the ideas, like someone who kind of manages uh, the ideas that are in, the ideas that are out, uh, recalling stuff that got worked on in rehearsal, in dance, of course, it's, it's, it's the same, someone who keeps uh, a record of movement or a record of, of concepts and ideas and imagery. And so I think that, that Norman, who is not a curator, he's a festival curator, which means he, he puts together, you know, live works f to be shown in, you know, in festivals, but never in a gallery, uh, as far as I know. So I feel like there's a, there's a kind of dramaturgical quality to the curation, which, is, which was to sort of um, work with, uh, and of course, you know, he and Colo had to divide up the space, figure out who would go where, and I, 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 in looking back at the at the images just recently, it occurred to me that the choice of where they put the Richard Foreman space with the with the columns kind of broken by the columns was, you know, exactly like the the spaces where he staged his works, which would always be in lofts and they'd always be kind of performing around these columns and you'd have seats where you'd have to kind of crane your neck around the loft column. So. Um, I do think there was a kind of, I mean, it's, it's very, in a way, a very literal, it's almost, I don't know if even exhibition design, sure, but um, uh, it's a kind of literal, uh, m kind of mimetic relationship of, of the space to the, to the aesthetic of the, of the work, you know. But um, yeah, no, no statements about that that I've ever seen. Any um, Mark, I, I have, um, yeah, I'd like to go back to something that you yeah. mentioned uh, in, uh, in your presentation. You asked a beautiful question, um, by what logic are found objects found? And hence, oh. um, but I mean, <laughs> I, would, I would like to say, I would like to think that archives are always very subjective and the way we approach archives is always a very subjective way. And um, I mean, I'm wondering, there are two ways to go about, to go about performances, right? Like the, the way show people did it. Uh, or Norman Frisch did it, or um, there's a sort of a, here there's a sort of a curating of residues mm. that are somehow by kind of, yeah, by kind of re, like curating these residues or these, these um, artifacts or there is something of the remove, like, I, I, I feel that we are removing a very crucial element of the very quality of the theatrical performance, which is, is, which is its ephemerality, sort of, mm -hmm. like the, 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 this quality of being so in time and space now and, and its disappearance, sort of, or, right. um, whereas in a show like this one, there is something about the reconstitution or yeah. the, revi 
the revisitation of certain works, which actually gives a completely new dimension right. for the to the works, but also in a different time, space, and situation and uh, um, uh, 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 condition, but also even politically yeah. uh, and sociolo uh, uh, socially and, and um, in, 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 in modes of actuality. It's completely different. It's, we're revisiting this in order to, yeah, it's, it's transforming the work somehow. Yeah. So I would like to maybe just hear you yeah, yeah. speak about no i think i mean i think you sort of got what i was trying to get at and summarized it really well uh, uh, you know um <clears throat> there are sort of polar opposite uh ideas where there's sort of the theory of stuff you know where you know more stuff is is sort of sort of closer to it or something and and so residue or performing objects which um uh there is i keep returning to this uh, question about uh, nostalgia um, as a kind of dangerous yeah. place to end up. Um, and I think that the show people, uh, you know, artists and, and curators uh, did their best to navigate that. And I don't think it was a super nostalgic show, but, um, you know, I think the the reason I mentioned I, I mentioned the work of Rebecca Schneider a couple times, and one can also speak about uh, Jose Munoz and and um, and others who who talk about kind of the the affective residue of performance, not the material residue, but the or or the 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 blurry line between what's material and what's affect, right? Is so interesting, and uh, I think that that discourse wasn't really so much in play at the time when this was happening. Uh, but um, I think that since we've, we've become much more uh, skeptical about that kind of temporal linearity, you know, here and now, there and then, uh, now and then, here and there, uh, 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 binaries. And uh, that's, again, why I think this show really uh, collapses that very much, and I, I feel like the uh, it's why I, I guess why I ended with that that um, suggesting that the performance really is living here in in the show, mm -hmm. um, not at a distance. Um, even though there are there are distanced elements that are brought for sure, and there is there are recorded elements uh, versus you know um, you're not turning a crank and jiggling cardboard in the sky. Um, but, uh, yeah, I do think there's a very, very different approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, this is very exciting. So I, I don't want to disparage shows that focus on documentation because we learn so much. Like, I, I think back to uh, what was very, um, uh, made a big impression on me was the, the sh retrospective of Jack Smith at M MoMA PS1. Um, I don't, couldn't tell you the year, but you know, early 2000s, late 90s, somewhere in there. Um, and you know, that was a showing of an archive that, you know, came this close to being thrown in a dumpster, was, you know, salvaged at the last minute um, by artists who knew that Smith had, had died, that his landlord was gonna, was starting to toss things in the garbage and just like, grabbed everything and and over time this became uh, uh, an archive of Smith's um, costumes props slides you know grant proposals uh, very very chaotic uh, bunch of stuff but was kind of managed into a very beautiful you know uh, picture of a work, I, he's someone who's performing I never saw live, I didn't know about him uh, before he, he passed. So um, that was a very meaningful kind of reconstruction, reanimation of that work and it had tons of documents and you know, props and whatnot, costumes. Um, so I think that type of show has its place and is super important, especially again when the people aren't around uh, anymore. 
um, or even if they are still around. I mean, that type of retrospective, that type of thing. Um, the Judson Dance Theater show at the MoMA in New York allowed them to use their very huge, fancy uh, atrium as a performance space. So that show came with, uh, you know, included a huge uh, uh series of performance, either of reconstructions or screenings of original film and video. So, you know, that's another way of thinking about is to sort of build a, when a museum or like the Tate has, you know, endless resources, right? Or we imagine uh, big resources. Uh, so, you know, a big hall like that um, can become anything, can become a performance site, can accept hundreds of spectators, um, can, you know, uh, can run for uh, endless amounts of time, so I think I think it's big. It's a, like a, it's a, going back to your question, Julia, about how could there? I, I'm kind of thinking how could there be a genealogy or a history? You know, we think of history of art books, but is there a history of performance exhibition? Not yet, unless unless there is one. I don't I don't know. But and again, I want to I want to. Uh, uh, um, uh, make, a, again, a disclaimer for the subjective nature of this list. I know there's plenty more that, that could, be, could be mentioned, um, probably happening right now in the city. So, Anything? Any other questions, remarks? Thank you for, oh, oh yes. There's one more. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Uh, I learned a lot today. It was very much interesting. I have a question about the institution that hosts those exhibitions. While the exhibition of living art or performance art uh, is underwriting, um, do you feel, uh, what's your take on how the future or current institution can uh, play a role into uh, those new methodology or strategy that we just discussed. Mm. Um, are they going to adapt? Uh, I, this uh, center uh, did a really incredible uh, thing for um, showing this type of art. However, it's a struggle for museums and galleries. So do you think, how do you see the future for this type of exhibitions? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, 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 one thing comes to mind as, uh, which has to do with the role of, um, there's a, another little list in the paper of, of institutions, types of institutions that house <clears throat> performance archives. Um, and that includes libraries, um, university collections, um, um, you know, and some of those can be quite small. Um, uh, I've, we've been a few times to see exhibits, for example, in the gallery space of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center, which is a very, you know, it's, a, it's not a huge space, but they have access to all of these uh, paper, paper records, you know, uh, basically collected papers of individuals. Um, I think the last one uh, that I, I attended was one, uh, uh, the, uh, an exhibit drawn from the papers of uh, the musician Lou Reed, who had just, you know, passed away. And there, there were, you know, um, sound installations, but all like scraps of, you know, mess notes and lyrics on scraps of paper and set lists from shows and all that kind of ephemera, which if you're, you know, if you're sort of into collecting and into, into ephemera, you know, it's, it's a great, um, a great kind of thing. But I think, I think smaller institutions can do this kind of work. It doesn't need to be on these grand scales. I think the big retrospectives are kind of, no longer necessary, or th when I say retrospective, I don't mean individual artist shows, but the sort of the the, the sort of grand uh, shows like Out of Actions, where th that I started with, have sort of been done, and I don't I don't think we need to show you know 
everything started with abstract expressionism and action painting and futurism and not like, okay, we sort of know those genealogies, but to go into the real specificity of who was around and who made that work and um, beyond the names that are at the forefront, you know, who were in the communities. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done and I, this is something I hope to work on um, a little bit, going back to your question about Wilson and that community. The reason I called them birds uh, when you saw that group photo is the name of his foundation is the Bird Hoffman Foundation of Birds and they kind of would refer to them uh, that themselves. Um, as a sort of shorthand as bird. So, you know, who those people are, who is taking their stories, how would how would those how are those stories going to be represented beyond, you know, the great director narrative? Um, I think that's the place to work in my, in my view. Um, um, but in terms you asked about institutions and I I kind of have faith in libraries in a way you know there's always like a corner in even in our library upstairs here there are a few small exhibition spaces um and the trick is to get uh libraries or or you know those with access to gallery space to understand that performance is something that's worth showing or something that can be shown in those contexts and i think that's that's quite exciting so I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Sure. Thank you. It Thanks was... again to Lynn and Julia for the invitation and the gallery, the Leonard and Bina Ellen Gallery. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.